Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET. Additional funding provided by the Leo Cox Beach Philanthropic Foundation. I love making my patients happy. It's giving love away. They're always telling me that I'm their favorite nurse. My residents are very grateful. It makes me want to keep going. The Research Foundation for SUNY. People, infrastructure, and technology make SUNY research an engine for New York's innovation economy. www.rfsuny.org. Winner of a New York State Emmy for Best Political Program, this is New York Now. Hi, everyone, and welcome to New York Now. I'm Matt Ryan. Thursday marked the planned conclusion of the legislative session. I say planned because as of Friday morning, they're still at the Capitol voting. Speaking of the Capitol, we're going to send it to downtown Albany, where my partner from the Times Union, Casey Seiler, will lead our on-site reporters roundtable. All right, thanks, Matt. Well, it is a beautiful day in New York State's capital for a rare al fresco meeting of the Reporters' Roundtable, where I'm happy to be joined by New York State Public Radio's Karen DeWitt and from my own paper, The Times Union, Matthew Hamilton, recently picked by City and State as a 40 under 40 rising star. That's right. He's got Congrats. many more years for that. Thanks. This uh, is probably the only time we're going to get outside today. I know. <laughs> the session's going, so we're enjoying Let's it. Let's enjoy it, because as you know, we will be spending the rest of the day in OT with the New York State Legislature right. inside this glorious pile of stone behind us. Mm -hmm. So, Karen, we're talking Friday mid-morning. Where are we at right now in resolving some of the biggest issues before the legislature and the governor? Well, they had a tentative kind of big, ugly deal, although so many issues are out of it. I would probably maybe call it the little ugly deal. <laughs> where they're going to do pension forfeiture, one year of mayoral control for New York City, um, possibly daily fantasy sports, making that legal in New York, and a few other issues, but as of late Thursday night, Friday morning, they hadn't nailed down everything. They're hoping they'll do it by the end of the day because they don't want to come back next week. They want to finish. So let's unpack some of that. When we talk about pension forfeiture, we are talking about beginning the, the process yes. of a constitutional amendment. Right. No, so the, the legislature today, tomorrow, by the end of December, needs to pass uh, the, the first concurrent resolution of the Assembly and the Senate that would uh, allow the pensions of those who entered the, the state retirement system and our elected officials uh, after, I think it's November 12th, 2011, to be stripped if they are convicted of a felony uh, related to their uh, their office. This is different where, you know, with the, the Shelley Silver case and the Dean Scalos case, uh, people are shocked by the fat pensions that they still mm -hmm. get to reap even though they have been sentenced to, you know, multiple years in prison. So it has to pass now and then it has to pass in the next legislature which is either next year or the year after that and then once it passes again then it goes on the ballot and the voters get to decide if uh, stripping pensions is actually uh, the right yeah, and now, I, th I think it seems like that's probably likely to pass <laughs> by the sentiment we should also, we should also vote, point yeah. out it doesn't apply to the two former legislative leaders right that or just got prison right, sentences, right, 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 they right. get to keep their pensions under this thing. They cannot forward. take it back from people. And a, a yeah. brief history lesson, this is something that has been pushed for for a long time. It's something that the governor demanded in his February 2015 ethics ultimatum. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm not going to sign the 2015 budget agreement mm -hmm. unless it's included. It turned into a bit of an impasse because the assembly balked at what they said was perhaps overbroad language that it would That's include right. janitors who p potentially are convicted of heisting, you know, uh, felony weight, office equipment, that kind of thing. So the the version that passed the assembly last night and that we think is going to pass the Senate right. is a little bit more constrained on who it affects. Well, and we think is going to pass the Senate is the glory of a framework agreement because uh, as the assembly was debating it late Thursday night and then it must have been Friday morning by the time they got done, I don't even remember what time I left the Capitol, <laughs> um, assembly Republicans were debating it saying, uh, so this is what we passed again last year and this isn't what the Senate and the governor agreed to. Are we sure that it's definitely gonna happen? And uh, mm -hmm. David Buckwald, the uh, sponsor of the measure from, from Westchester County said, this is what we understand is going to happen, so you never know what happens on, on Friday. Yeah. Okay, and the big swap 
mm -hmm. for the Assembly's action and maybe the Senate's action is going to be a one-year extension of mayoral control, which is something that everybody supports, but mm -hmm. this year became controversial. Why? Well, mostly because the Senate Republicans wanted to torture the New York City Mayor <laughs> Bill de Blasio, who tried to get them voted out of power in 2014. He backed Senate Democrats. He was unsuccessful, and they're really mad at him. He also doesn't get along with Governor Cuomo, so Governor Cuomo hasn't really been in this fight, but he hasn't been trying to stop it either. I think he's happy to see it play out the way it has. And I think I think everybody does not want mayoral control to lapse. I mean, everybody at the Capitol seems to be in agreement that we can't go back to the old system that mm -hmm. we used to have. But, you know, John Flanagan, the Senate Majority Leader, being the former chair of the Education Committee, I mean, he's really entrenched on education issues. And, you know, certainly I think there are, are political, you know, goings on, but also he just doesn't feel that the mayor has given it the, the attention that it deserves. I mean, you know, the mayor didn't show up at a, a a hearing that the Senate held directly across the street from City Hall in Manhattan, and that really rubbed them the wrong way. You know, it was a struggle to get de Blasio to come up here last year to do it. So it's just, it's a combination of things that, that leads to. But, but in fairness, he'd already, de Blasio had already shown up for one hearing they had that lasted about four or five yeah. hours. But when, so, you're at the, when you're at the mercy of the legislature, yeah, I guess I you have to jump through their hoops. The New York right. City mayors have been plagued by that So uh, what I think is fair to say, fair to describe as a, a minimum level of action mm -hmm. on ethics reform, a minimum yes. level of action on mayoral control, yeah, he's going to have to crawl back to the legislature again next year. Something that the governor put on the agenda only about a week and a half ago was a bill that would, well, it's not a bill yet, it's mm, a proposal yeah. to tighten up the definition of what constitutes improper collaboration between a political candidate and an independent expenditure yeah, effort. Essentially cracking down on super PACs, making sure they're really independent. Super PAC money does not really factor into state races, though, so they can do this without any harm. If they close the LLC loophole, the limited liability companies, they would actually see a hit in the donations that they get because a lot of corporations use that to get around donations limits. So it seems like that is likely to pass. I'm mean, not sure where that was. I heard different things when I was leaving. Independent expenditure, that independent is not expenditures, LLCs. Yes, it's likely to, to happen because it's, it doesn't really hurt them and they'll get credit for doing something about ethics reform, which polls show 97% of the public want. And so far, they haven't done anything besides the, the pension forfeiture. Matt, you might be 40 under 40, but you are of legal age to drink. Yes, <laughs> it looks like things are going to get better for those who are enthusiastic of having a cocktail of a Sunday morning early. Well, yeah, there was the, the so-called brunch bill that was included in this omnibus package of uh, alcohol law tweaks that the governor had proposed. And what it does, uh, the compromise that they came to is beginning at 10 a.m. on Sundays, you'll be able to get a Bloody Mary. No, I'm sorry, 8, on. right? No, 10 a.m. 10 a.m.? 8 was the original eight, proposal. 8 will be special 10 a.m. Is, is the compromise. 8 uh, bars and restaurants can apply for up to 12 special permits a year uh, to, to begin selling at 8 a.m. I mean, which, which someone it, had mentioned one of those special occasions is Mother's Day, which I found kind of <laughs> amusing somehow. No, but, but the, <laughs> the, whole, the, whole idea, drink early. the whole idea here is like the brunch bill affects uh, consumers as an easy public relations win. But the broad overarching thing here is this helps uh, craft distilleries, uh, cideries, breweries um, across the state, which has, has become uh, a main economic development focus of the governor. And so, you know, you appease the business community. It's a relatively easy lift. It's not difficult to up update laws that came in, you know, at the end or during prohibition, you know, nobody really has real uh, hard and fast uh, feelings about those anymore. So you get those done, but not really clear if we're going to be able to drink in movie theaters quite yet, which passed the Senate, but is probably going to get stuck uh, in the assembly. And if you drink too much in movie theaters or at brunch, you got to be careful about getting home right. because apparently we're not going to get Uber and Lyft upstate on Long Another Island big outside of New York City, which is again something that had broad public support but just seemed to fall apart in the final days and of the session. And fell apart because of a significant legal and logistical concerns or because of opposition from the taxi industry? Uh, you know, it's hard to, to say what that was. I'd heard that the trial lawyers had something against it, but I have to admit I haven't, in just the frenzy, I haven't completely looked into that. But Uber and Lyft did have like the top lobbyists, even a former aide to Governor Cuomo was working for Uber, and they still didn't get it through, which is 
pretty interesting. One of the most uh, bizarre, I think, reversals and counter-reversals of the week was Kathy Marchione's uh, decision to amend a bill that had already passed the Assembly that was very important with her uh, because it would have extended the statute of limitations for personal injury suits mm -hmm. um, uh, for folks who were potentially injured as the result of Superfund site pollution yeah, that would right. essentially give them three more years. And affected uh, her constituents in uh, Hoosick Falls. Um, she tried to amend the bill to make it weaker. She just she was just got reamed on Twitter from the Hoosick Falls residents who, you know, despite being an upstate little town or, you know, surprise, actually quite sophisticated. They have a Twitter feed and they really went after her. They were calling her Benedict Arnold. And so finally she amended the bill back to the original version and surprisingly it passed. This has huge implications for industry. It could cost them billions of dollars. Passed and unanimously and now goes to the governor. Yeah, Kathy Marchion's one of the most conservative members of the Senate. So I think that might have been one of the most significant things they, they did this week because the implications are far reaching as we find more and more out more and more about pollution and all these towns across uh, the state, um, uh, industry is going to be more liable for, for paying for their health care when they get sick. I want to get back to who's if falls they get sick. In, in a minute, but Matt, what about daily fantasy sports? That is one thing that still remains hanging as we stand so here. So all week we've kind of gone in this circular motion where we start in the morning and the, the two sponsors say there's a three-way deal and then we get halfway through the day and someone says, no, we're still counting votes in the assembly, there's no deal yet, and then we come at night and they say, well, there's, there's probably going to be a deal, we'll take it up tomorrow, and then we come back in and we repeat the cycle all week long. So uh, we'll see what happens today. The last I knew, the assembly was still counting the votes to see if it's going to be and there. I think the Senate is still counting votes from talking to the Senate sponsor, John Bonasek, mm -hmm. last night. He didn't want to come out and say that, but he said that he needed to talk it over with his members and didn't rule out that he might need some Democrats to vote for it in order for it to pass. And then I would assume the Democratic senators are going to extract something for their vote, and that's going to you know, delay things even longer. So switching back to Hoosick Falls, mm -hmm. Karen, you and I attended a really emotional press conference on uh, Wednesday involving residents of Hoosick Falls who were very, very upset that there's, there have been no legislative hearings. After the press conference, they went yeah. down outside of the executive chamber. After a short wait, they were invited in for a meeting with Jim Alatris, state operations director. Oh, right. You, I will continue to uh, insist, snuck into the meeting and refused to leave. It, well, it was a bit of an, an accident. The residents said they wanted the media in the meeting. And so I was you know, glad to accommodate. The rest of the media wanted to go in too. And they opened the door. I walked in with the residents. I got halfway down the hall and realized, where are all my colleagues? I'm all alone here. <laughs> And uh, all the guys in suits kept coming up and saying, Karen, you have to leave, you have to leave, we don't want you here. And the residents kept saying, no, we want you here, we want a witness, because they were feeling very mistrustful of the Cuomo administration. They were kind of afraid to go in a meeting, they didn't know what was going to happen. So I finally said to Cuomo's aides, you know, so arrest me. <laughs> well, oh. And they, you know, I realized that they really couldn't do anything at that point. And the funny thing is it was a perfectly good meeting. They let the residents vent. Jim Malatris was extremely professional. There was nothing that the Cuomo administration had to be ashamed of in that meeting. So why they didn't want it public is kind of a mystery because they actually ended up looking good. They forged a relationship with the residents. They set up an email account where the residents can contact them directly because their biggest complaint was that the health department wasn't listening to them, sending them these blood tests in the mail with these high PFOA levels with no context and not very much support. So they actually made a lot of progress just by, you know, citizens marching down to the governor's door. We're going to hear more from Jenna Flanagan about uh, that very emotional visit to the Capitol later on in the show. So, all right, uh, we're talking at about uh, 10 a.m. on Friday morning. When will the legislature wrap up? I will put both of you on the spot. Matt? Optimistic lawmakers say 5 p.m. Karen? I already put a bet for 4 p.m., so I'm sticking for that, hoping that it may be 6. Okay, 6 I'm going to say 6.30. Okay. So yeah, thanks very much to Karen DeWitt of New York State Public Radio and Matthew Hamilton, my office mate at the Times Union. And now we will kick it back to Matt at the desk. All right, thanks, Casey. Do you believe this has been a productive legislative session? That is our poll question. Let us know what you think by voting on our website, nynow.org. I know that one of the things that this governor likes to hear least out of anybody is talking about Hoosick Falls. It's an embarrassment to him. The way his administration acted is potentially criminal. 
Uh, they certainly denied the public vital information. So yeah, I can see why he doesn't want to hold them, but the people of New York deserve answers. That was Assemblyman Steve McLaughlin from our program last week when we asked, should the legislature hold hearings about the water contamination in Hoosick Falls? And the overwhelming answer was yes. Not surprisingly, many people from Hoosick Falls voting, including Laura, we have been poisoned and deserve to be heard. What if it was their children? Patrick in New York City watching on WNET, what business does the legislature have that's more important than the health of our children? And Ashley in Johnsonville, just south of Hoosick Falls, said officials need to be held accountable for trying to sweep things under the rug. I personally have lost several friends and family to cancer. We appreciate everyone who took the time to vote. The website again is nynow.org. While you're browsing, you can watch any of our past programs and follow links to us on Facebook, Flickr, and Twitter, where our handle is at nynow underscore PBS. You'll also find a link to the Capitol Confidential blog run by Casey and his crew, which can also be found at timesunion.com. The plight of the people in Hoosick Falls was still an issue this week at the Capitol, as you heard. Our Jenna Flanagan has more. In January, we took you to the small and rural village of Hoosick Falls, which was grappling with a report of contaminated water after elevated levels of the chemical plafluorooctanoic acid, or PFOA, was detected in the water supply. In the months that followed, residents expressed confusion, frustration, and even anger over the inconsistent communication between those affected and their state and local government. We need the dialogue um, to be elevated on this issue. It needs to not be a, a small New York area or a bigger New York area. This needs to be a national dialogue on water. Robert Allen is a father of four and music teacher in the yeah. Hoosick Falls School District. Like other residents, he had grown frustrated with the water supply situation when a colleague suggested he watch a Cuomo administration PSA on YouTube, praising the governor's success in ensuring a safe and clean environment. Hi, I'm Mark Ruffalo and I'm a proud New Yorker. Clean air, clean water, uncontaminated food, taking our kids to parks that are safe. These are all things that we take for granted. But we have to fight for them if we want to guarantee them for future generations. Allen describes seeing the video as shocking, considering his New York community did not have clean water. So he made his own PSA. Hi, I'm Rob Allen and I'm a proud New Yorker. Clean air, clean water, uncontaminated foods, taking our kids to parks that are safe are things we used to take for granted. But here in Hoosick Falls, where dumping of cancer-causing chemical PFOA has resulted in the contamination of our water supply, we have realized that we have to fight for our own well-being if we want to guarantee it for future generations. From our perspective in Hoosick Falls, where we've been shouting for months and months and months, the people were the ones to say, hey, there's a problem here. The people identified it. The people have been advocating all this time and the government had been dragging their feet for so long. The frustration had been simmering for months, but when it was revealed in a Politico expose that officials in the Cuomo administration and the mayor's office knew of the dangerously high chemical contamination residents were consuming, that frustration boiled into anger. First, we were irritated with that, finding out the 18 month uh, that the Department of Health fought with the EPA to tell us to stop drinking the water. So we were already kind of inflamed about that, and then the envelopes came. Those envelopes from the State Department of Health, addressed individually to every man, woman, and child, contained the PFOA parts per trillion found to be in each person's blood. Several residents, including most of the children, tested well above the EPA's advised baseline of 70 parts per trillion. That, coupled with a sense of inaction from the government, which declined to hold public hearings on the matter, was too much for Hackett. We decided if they're not going to listen to us, they're going to see us. Hackett and friend Michelle Baker launched the Twitter feed PFOA Project NY1, featuring images of Hoosick Falls residents holding up cards with their Department of Health tested blood contamination levels. Talked about it with my family, and my daughter and son-in-law agreed will do these pictures. How can you not look at a six-year-old with 142 PFOA level? If you won't hear us, you're going to see us. 
Hackett and a group of locals from the village, town, and surrounding area took those very images with them to the Capitol. Along with Assemblyman Steve McLaughlin, tried to push the legislature to hold public hearings on the government's handling of the PFOA contamination of Hoosick Falls water. A hearing is to hear from people. And if, in fact, there was wrongdoing, then I would ask you, what is wrong with saying there was wrongdoing? Why do we hold hearings ever on anything? Why do we pass bills? Most of the bills, or a very large number of the bills we pass, are to hold people responsible for something that, they either, that either happened and we're addressing it, or that we don't want to happen. So I don't understand why we have this mantra in this building that, well, maybe we can hold hearings, but God forbid we ask any real questions and hold anybody responsible. If that's what comes out of the hearing, so be it. Immediately after their press conference, the Hoosick Falls residents got a closed-door audience with Jim Malatras, Governor Cuomo's director of state operations. Our own Karen DeWitt was pool reporter. The governor's response health. on everything was, get as many facts as you can and get as many resources as you can to the community. If Mount Sinai is not enough, then bring more doctors in. If the briefings for your primary care physicians was not enough, do more. If the study that we have currently in place is enough, do a longer term study and try to get the company to pay for it. If this blood testing at this time isn't enough, then do staggered blood testing. Do everything you, to me, do everything you humanly can to make that happen. That's what his reaction was. Allen called the meeting a good start, even though it didn't result in any official promise of a public hearing or a promise of continued biomonitoring or even finding an alternative water source. But it did give them a sense of what was happening and why. The fact that this kind of testing is very uh, specific and tricky and there's very few places in the country who do this. And they were working on their own approach to testing so that they could do this in, I think, a more efficient and faster way. Yeah. For many residents of Hoosick Falls, like Allen, what they'd really like their government to clarify is what those blood test levels actually mean. So that as biomonitoring continues, families don't have to try and comprehend form letters from the Department of Health. We, we opened mine first because I figured, you know, how bad would it be? It was in the 50s. I didn't expect that. I just, I didn't expect that for whatever reason. Uh, we opened up my wife's, uh, which was a great, great, great love number, and I was really relieved to see that. And then I said, all right, let's go to our youngest, my daughter Emma, who's, you know, when she was tested was under two, and she's two now, so how high could it be? 112. It was, twi it was over twice my score, which floored me because she, uh, she's only been alive for, uh, you know, less than two years at the time of the testing. Uh, I, that, that was a very hard moment. I'm never going to forget that moment. I didn't really have much to say for a long time after I opened that up. Um, and after digesting that, um, we sort of went through the kids and it turned out that the younger they were, the higher the number was. Um, so of course our youngest ended up having the highest numbers, but the average of my kids is, is well above mine. Um, and that was, that was scary. All right, back here in studio with Jenna, Robert Allen, who you saw in the, that piece, says one of the problems is no one really knows what these levels even mean. Well, yeah, and that's what's so concerning is that if you got a letter from the Department of Health saying that, say, your three-year-old had 142 parts per trillion of PFOA in their blood, does that mean that they might get a certain type of cancer? Does that mean that they're going to get a certain type of cancer? What type of cancers are we talking about? Or is the kid in the clear and you've been worrying about nothing? I got to imagine one of the, the concerns is going to be uh, going going forward. Is the state going to stay with us and help us in this matter and yeah, keep us and up to date? That's and, a really big concern is making sure one of the things that the people in the village really, really want is to make sure that there's continued biomonitoring, like continued testing of their blood, um, even with these filters, although no one's still ready to drink the tap water yet. Right. But even with these filters, um, are our blood levels uh, of the contaminant coming down? Um, is there something else that we can be doing? Is it also in the water? What about when we shower? What about the 
soil. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just so many questions that haven't been answered. It's understandable that there's a high level of anxiety. Off air, you told me something interesting is in that you can understand there's a lot of anger um, oh, yeah. in this area. Yeah. And that there have been some physical threats uh, directed towards uh, people in Hoosick Falls, correct? Yeah, uh, actually I was at a public meeting um, earlier this week and the village mayor himself actually said that uh, some threats of physical violence had been sent to either the town board or himself and that that had been turned over to the police. Um, but I think that that's more of an example of just the the frustration and the helplessness that people are feeling in Hoosick Falls, that they haven't gotten any clear direct answers and that they've had a lot of difficulty in their communication with the Department of Health. Well, let's hope uh, that meeting this week with uh, Andrew Cuomo's top aide, Jim Melantris, will kind of help things as we move forward here. Ho hopefully, for everybody involved, hopefully. All right, thank you, Jenna. Uh, our time is up. We leave you today with scenes from downtown Jamestown in Chautauqua County. And make sure to hang with us until the very last shot where you'll get to see the infamous Lucille Ball statue that is coming down later this summer. It's located in nearby Celeron, her hometown. It's being replaced with something that looks a little more like her. Thanks for watching. For Jenna Flanagan, Casey Seiler, I'm Matt Ryan. We'll see you next time right here on your local PBS station. The Research Foundation for SUNY. People, infrastructure, and technology make SUNY research an engine for New York's innovation economy. www.rfsuny.org. CSEA. I'm a police, fire, and EMS dispatcher. When their first phone call comes to us, we get the fire, the police, and the ambulance to their location. I'm keeping them safe by providing them with a the service that they expect.